I'm very excited about tonight's uh, speaker because uh, despite the fact that I'm a physicist now, my first love uh, and my first field was microbiology. And basically my foray into physics has been nothing more than an attempt to understand microbiology. I just got stuck there and I never made it back. So I'm very happy to hear Josh talk about microbiology tonight. So I'll give you a little information about Josh before he begins. Um, Josh is a microbiologist and assistant professor at East Stroudsburg University. While earning his doctoral degree at the Pennsylvania State University College of Medicine, he worked primarily on dissecting mechanisms by which viruses <coughs> assemble during replication. His postdoctoral research at the University of Miami Sylvester Center, Cancer Institute, focused on the use of genetically engineered viruses as novel treatments for cancer. In 2005, he accepted a faculty position at Nova Southeastern University and remained there for 10 years. While at NSU, he taught courses in microbiology, genetics, immunology, and epidemic disease. Dr. Loomis then moved to East Strasburg University in 2015 and continued his teaching and research in microbiology. He has since, since become a partner in the Small World Initiative, which is a global consortium of scientists and students working together in search of novel antibiotics produced by soil microorganisms. Dr. Loomis has published his research in numerous scientific journals, including the Journal of Viro Virology and Nature Immunology. Additionally, he has recently published a book entitled Epidemics, The Impact of Germs and Their Power Over Humanity. He continues to run an active research program with his undergraduate and graduate students in many different subfields of microbiology, which include virology, biofilm formation, and antibiotic discovery. So that's certainly a full plate for tonight. So with no further ado, Josh Loomis. Thank you for those wonderful introductions. I'll try to live up to them. Uh, so let's get this going here. So as Dr. Elwood uh, really just said at the, the end there, the, the idea for this topic kind of grew out of my book. Um, so just a little bit more about it. I, the, the book went through the 10 worst epidemics in, in human history and really looked at how they impacted society and uh, medicine and warfare. And as I finished the book, I started thinking, okay, well, what's, what's in the future for epidemics? Because I, I talked about bubonic plague and smallpox and typhus, a lot of these, these older epidemic diseases. And I started thinking, what, what is scaring me right now? So as I look to the future for myself, my child, um, what diseases really scare me um, that I haven't talked about? And I thought about Ebola and Zika. And I really came to the conclusion that the thing that scared me the most um, was this idea of antibiotic-resistant infections. And it actually became kind of the 11th chapter, you know, after the 10. That was my, my very last chapter of the book. So uh, I thought it'd be, maybe I could share my fear with you and that'll make me feel better, or maybe I'll freak you all out uh, by the end of this talk. So I don't know what effect it'll have on you. But um, so yeah, that's, that's where the idea for this came from. So these are just showing some headlines that may be commonly seen uh, as you open a newspaper or, or, or click a, a website. Um, you hear these phrases, superbugs and uh, antibiotic resistance. You know, are we in the cusp of the post-antibiotic era? Um, you know, killer TB, and, and you really hear these, these phrases. And it, for me, they're frightening. Um, and, you know, being a microbiologist, you know, I, I know m the kind of background of, of these diseases, so maybe that makes me more fearful of it or less, but um, I, I always wonder if someone that knows nothing about microbiology, when you see killer superbug is, is hitting your city, of what impact that has on, on you know, your emotional stability and you know, how, how fearful you are of that. Much like when you would hear news stories in the 1800s that cholera was headed for your city. I imagine it has much of the same impact. So hopefully tonight I'll educate you on what the problem is, what causes the problem, and ultimately hopefully how we can solve the problem in the, in the next uh, few years. So just a little bit first about what are antibiotics. Um, I, I'm assuming I have a mixed crowd here of many of you that aren't biologists have no care, you don't care at all about biology, but so I figured I would, I would start with kind of the basics. Antibiotics are, are chemicals, classically chemicals that have been, are made by natural organisms. Mostly they're made by uh, bacteria and, and fungi, um, and primarily we'll talk about this a little later, a special group of bacteria called actinomycetes, 
which are common soil bacteria. So you see it, if you kind of look on the right side, there are some antibiotics that maybe you've heard of just in going to the doctor yourself or in the news, penicillin and streptomycin and neomycin. So you see antibiotics classically have been these natural products. And everyone at the very least has heard the name Alexander Fleming and, and the, how he kind of accidentally discovered penicillin back in the late 20s. Um, but really of importance for this talk is this idea that most of these antibiotic producers are, are derived from microbes that live in the soil. And as we kind of go to the, towards the end of the talk tonight and discuss the Small World Initiative that was brought up that many, I see some of my micro students that are in here that have worked on this project. Um, this is where we, we go to look for new antibiotics since most of the important ones that we use are, are found in the soil. Now, you may wonder why are bacteria making chemicals that kill bacteria, okay? And that when I was first learning this, it didn't inherently make sense to me. But you should think about competition. You, if you're a bacterial cell, you have a lot of competitors around you. The idea is I'm gonna kill all of you so I can have free reign of the environment and of, of nutrients. So pretty much all these antimicrobial chemicals, the goal is to eliminate your competitors. So these microbes have been in this kind of chemical warfare for millions of years. Um, and so we're gonna see as we talk about resistance to antibiotics, hopefully it's not a shock to you how resistance developed. If you have some group making these toxic <coughs> chemicals, it would make sense that the, the microbes that they're targeting would also evolve mechanisms of resisting those toxic chemicals. Um, and, and we're gonna see ultimately that's where most resistance comes from is this natural resistance of uh, this, this kind of ongoing warfare. Now, in the, really the 1970s, uh, and uh, maybe chemists could really narrow it down, but um, scientists had the idea, okay, these, an these natural antibiotics are effective, but they're starting to lose their um, efficacy. So what if we chemically alter them a little bit to make them slightly new? Or what if we synthesize something completely from scratch that has antimicrobial activity? So we saw this large group of new, what we call semi-synthetic, so those would be ones that are kind of derived from a natural antibiotic that they, they tweaked a little bit, um, and those that are fully synthetic. So these things that don't exist in nature, that they made in a chemistry lab. Um, and those really started hitting the market in the 70s and 80s, and again, they've had some moderate uh, efficacy uh, in treating infection. So that just gives you a little background of what antibiotics are, where they come from, and, and will set the stage for understanding resistance. Now, we're not gonna go, I know this kind of scares you when you see, especially my students, uh, a chart like this. We're not gonna systematically go through how antibiotics work, but I just wanna make a couple of big points here. These again are toxins that specifically target bacteria. Okay, so when you hear antibiotic, it's not referring to a virus, it's not referring to protozoa or, or fungi. Okay? Antimicrobial drug is the kind of the broad term here, but antibiotic specifically is referring to chemicals that kill bacteria. Okay, it was coined in the 40s by uh, Salman Waksman uh, from Rutgers, who won a Nobel Prize for discovering streptomycin. Um, so these antibiotics really target two, th three major uh, unique aspects of bacteria. So here's the goal, and don't lose, lose sight of this as we go th through the talk. To have a good antibiotic, you need a chemical that will kill the bacteria, but not kill the host, right? <laughs> it's useless to have a chemical that I, I, I take as a pill that makes me sick in eliminating the infection. Sometimes it can make you sicker than, than the infection was. So the best antibiotics are non-toxic. Now some of the early ones that were developed in really before penicillin hit the market, the sulfa drugs, and there are several antibiotics, one called sal salvarsan, that had an arsenic base. They worked on certain microbes, but they were extremely toxic. Anything with arsenic that you're purposely taking to your body can, can cause some serious damage, and they did. Those antibiotics really killed a lot of people. And then when Fleming came out with penicillin, why it was such a wonder drug is that it was relatively safe um, and, and non-toxic. So most of these antibiotics, you'll see again, are targeting something really unique about bacteria. So um, again, not to go into all the little details, but the cell wall, um, our cells don't have a cell wall. This is this kind of outer covering that some cells like plant cells have and bacteria have. Human cells do not have a cell wall. So Antibiotics like penicillin, for instance, uh, and all the beta-lactam antibiotics, they target this unique structure that bacteria really only have. And then the other big group, as you see on the left side here, are antibiotics that target 
the protein-making machine of, of, of all cells, which are ribosomes, right? All cells have ribosomes. They make our proteins. Human ribosomes are slightly different than bacterial ribosomes. So a lot of the antibiotics, in some way, target these bacterial ribosomes. Okay, so why is this important? Because when you start to understand resistance, so if you're a bacterial cell and you want to survive being targeted with this chemical, it would make sense that you're going to have to target these structures. You're going to maybe change your ribosome or change the cell wall, and that's how you can become resistant to the antibiotic. So again, that's, and there's other targets, uh, DNA synthesis and, and folic acid synthesis. But um, So here's some statistics to kind of freak you out uh, as we again move forward in here. Uh, you may not know, but infectious disease is the second leading cause of death in the world behind cardiovascular disease and just ahead of, of cancer. Um, if you look at individual infectious diseases, it, they're kind of way down the list, but when you put them all together, it's uh, number one, about 17 million people a year die from some infectious disease. Mostly it's pneumonia uh, and diarrhea diseases, primarily in the third world. So that's scary enough. Um, taking that into account, really before the 1940s, you know, let's say 1930s with some of those more toxic ones, your life was, in, when you got infected with something, you just had to hope and pray that your immune system would defeat it. And, and very often that was not the case. Hence, those 10 big epidemic diseases that were in my book. That's why they killed 30 million people, 100 million people, is because there weren't effective drugs to combat it. And, and, and very often there weren't uh, vaccines to prevent it. However, the discovery of penicillin and then really the antibiotic revolution that happened in the 1950s changed that. There were people that were quoted after penicillin was discovered that we're seeing the end of all infectious disease. Now, uh, anytime you see a quote like that, you should always chuckle. Um, I remember when HIV was discovered, they claimed we would have a vaccine in six months. That was in 1981. Um, yeah, here we are, and there's, we're, there's no vaccine in sight. So anytime you see someone making a grandiose statement like that, ignore it pretty much. Um, but what we did see is now people weren't dying from childbirth or surgery. Um, or routine, you know, you cut yourself shaving or you, you stepped on a nail, that often was a death sentence. Um, death in warfare was, most people died in, from war from wound infections than from bullets. And actually it wasn't until, I think it was 1910, uh, was the first war in human history where more people died from actual battle wound, from, from you know, the, the, the bombs and the guns rather than microbes. So microbes have claimed more people in war and it's not even close. All the generals get credit for, for battles, but microbes really did most of the dirty work in, in most wars. Um, but what they noticed, almost immediately after antibiotics were introduced, they were starting to see um, resistant strains. And we're gonna see kind of crazy, I think it's on the next slide or slide after. They actually found a penicillin resistant strain um, of, of bacteria before penicillin was released into the market. Um, as penicillin was being developed, they started looking to say, I wonder if there's anything out there that's resistant. So they found resistance to the antibiotic before the antibiotic was released to the population. Um, it shows you that these microbes inherently have this resistance. Um, and, and really the introduction, and that's, that was the, the first thing there, that penicillin was introduced pretty much during World War II, um, again, largely to the troops first and then to the general population. There was a paper in 1940, I think it was from a British uh, physician, that found a resistant strain when they were doing just the clinical trials. And this just, I think, uh, I know you can't see the little details of the chart, but on <coughs> the right side are dates of when different antibiotics were introduced. The left side is when resistance was, was seen. So you see that there are a lot of little notches, I'm sorry, on the left side, you see there's a lot of little notches showing resistance. So you could see very often within a decade, Tetracycline, 1950, by 1960, they were seeing resistance kind of flourishing. MRSA, so, and we'll talk about MRSA in a little bit, that's methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, was found only two years after methicillin started being uh, prescribed in clinics, which again is scary. And if you look really at uh, levofloxacin, it was the same year. They released it and within the same year they were already seeing resistance. So it seems like we're fighting a losing battle here, that we keep creating new chemicals and the bacteria seem to be one step ahead of us all the time. And, and you're gonna see that generally is the case. They've had billions of years to evolve uh, and, and they're very good at, at mutating and developing new abilities. And unfortunately for us, um, that's kind of going against what we're trying to do, which is, which is kill them. So here's some more statistics. Uh, Really in the 19, this, uh, this chart I think does a, a good job of just kind of giving you the general. 
1980s and 90s is when we saw a major increase in antibiotic resistance in the, in the population worldwide. So before the 80s and the 70s and 60s and 50s, you saw isolated cases. This random hospital in Britain had a case of MRSA, and this random hospital in Atlanta had a... And then in, in the 80s and 90s, we started seeing localized outbreaks of resistance. I remember I was living in South Florida in Fort Lauderdale, where there was a rash of MRSA infections from a school bus that a kid had a MRSA infection, sat on the school bus, and every kid that sat on that seat started getting MRSA infections. And there was another case where this freak, again, I'm going to really freak you guys out tonight, <laughs> where someone had MRSA and went to the beach and buried themselves, you know, the kids buried in the sand, and then people were getting MRSA infections from going in that same sand. Um, staff is actually really resistant to, to salt. So now when, every time you go to the beach, no one will ever do that again. Uh, it really is kind of rare, but it shows you how hardy these microbes are um, and, and how scary it is. So here's some, some statistics. I'm not a statistician, but I think numbers sometimes will, will really illustrate the issue that we're dealing with. So um, estimated, some people estimate about two and a half million, some say two million, that there's about two million antibiotic resistant illnesses in the world, uh, or in the United States every year. World, it's, it's significantly more than that. Um, and again, numbers 23 to 25,000 deaths, specifically from infections that could not be treated with antibiotics. So someone went to the hospital, they had an infection that normally you'd be able to give an IV and, and a week later they'd be out of the hospital perfectly healthy. They went for that treatment regimen and they never got better because the antibiotics simply just weren't working. Um, so about 23 to 25,000 a year in the United States alone. Worldwide, we're looking at about 700,000 deaths from antibiotic resistant infections. Now, when you look at incidents of cancer and cardiovascular disease, you may not, I mean, 700,000 is, is a big number. I don't care what you're talking about. Um, but in the big scheme of things of what kills human beings, it's, it's really not a major blip uh, on the radar. But when we start looking at projections, if you look at that graph and follow it out to 2020, 2030, 2040, you can start to see that we're on the, uh, on the cusp of something really significant. That, uh, and I'm going to show you some of the, the data modeling on the next slide. Don't worry, it's not, uh, I'm not a mathematician, so it's, it's data modeling for dummies uh, that I'll show you. Um, just financially, they estimate it's about $20 billion are spent in the United States every year, either from cost of treating antibiotic resistant infections or lost work. Um, so that's money that's you know, lost productivity because people are, are hospitalized because they have antibiotic resistant infections. So here is the, the modeling I was telling you about that uh, a number of uh, microbiologists, and, and this was partly sponsored by the World Health Organization, they wanted to know if we don't change what we're doing with antibiotic resistant infections, what, we, what are we going to look like by 2050? Um, and so they, they contracted a couple think tanks, uh, RAND was one of them that, that got on it, and then KPMG. Um, this was done about four years ago. And they estimated if statistical trends continue as they are right now, that by 2050 we're looking at 10 million deaths a year from antibiotic resistant infections. Remember, we're at 700,000 now. We're looking at 10 million a year, um, with most of those coming from um, the third world. So. Uh, <coughs> Again, these are estimates. This doesn't mean that exactly 4.73 million people are going to die in Asia from in resistant infections in 2050, but this is what they're projecting if nothing is done about it. Um, and, and that's a scary number to me because that surpasses any individual infection that we see right now. Usually HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria are the top three individual killers uh, you know, in the microbial world. Um, and they're in the one to two million range at most. So we're talking something that surpasses every other infectious disease that we have right now. Um, that, and, and just kind of again more financially, we're talking a, a loss of global GDP by upwards of three and a half percent, which uh, again, I'm not now not an economist. Um, that sounds pretty significant, not knowing I haven't had microeconomics and macroeconomics for 20 years. Uh, but this number certainly is, and actually the two think tanks disagreed. One put it about 50 trillion, the other put about 100 trillion lost uh, in money in, 35, in the next 35 years from just antibiotic resistant infections. We're not talking about treating HIV and dealing with diabetes and COPD and all these other things that kill people. We're talking just antibiotic resistant infections if nothing is done. Um, and here, for me, is the scariest, because you know, certainly lost money is, and, and GDP and productivity is a big issue. But this idea that now 
you know, I've had my wisdom teeth out pretty recently, and the doctor put me on prophylactic antibiotics just in case uh, an infection would arise. Um, those are the type of procedures now where you could end up with a resistant infection and it doesn't get better. Or again, childbirth, simple surgeries that you wouldn't think twice about getting can now kill you like they did in the 1600s because, again, that's when infection generally um, w was a major issue in those type of procedures. So um, this, this frightened me, and this is one of the reasons why I included uh, this in the last chapter of my book and ultimately why I'm telling you about. Sometimes sharing your fears makes you feel better about it. So here, I just want to go through uh, the World Health, if you go on their website, the World Health Organization, uh, on their website has a list of the, the most dire infections that they see right now, the ones that they're, they're most worried about worldwide. So I want to just go through a, a few of those. I don't want to bombard you with diseases because it can easily turn into that kind of talk. Um, but one that actually has been in the news pretty recently uh, in, in the U.S. is drug-resistant uh, gonorrhea, as, as if gonorrhea isn't bad enough. Now we have drug-resistant gonorrhea. For many years, gonorrhea could easily be treated with penicillin. And just so you can interpret this graph, what you're seeing as you get in more intensive colors is increasing, increasing resistance. So as kind of when it's introduced, it, there was very little resistance, and as you see, as you get to 90, you know, for penicillin, it's becoming heavily resistant. They're seeing a lot more resistance just, you know, worldwide. And what should really frighten you, as you go down the line to, let's say, 2010, um, as we go to, you know, Cipro, which everyone has heard of with, with anthrax um, terrorist attack uh, some years ago, that if you're treating gonorrhea with Cipro, that means it has not, tetracycline has not worked, penicillin has not worked, and sulfur drugs have not worked. You're not going to start with Cipro, usually. So we're talking now multi-drug resistant gonorrhea. So a case where you may go and have to go on eight antibiotics in order to, to treat an infection that used to be treatable with one antibiotic. And you say, well, who cares if it's one or eight? The problem when you start overloading people with antibiotics is you guys, for those that, um, well, you've watched TV enough on um, probiotics and, and things like yogurt and milk, uh, we have natural bacteria in our bodies that, that help in our digestion, that protect us from infectious disease. And when you give someone seven or eight antibiotics to get rid of a bad microbe, it also eliminates most of the good microbes. Um, and then very often you could struggle for years trying to reestablish your normal floor and, 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 and bad diseases can move in as a result of that. So um, again, it may not seem like a big issue, but the more antibiotics you're having to give people, um, you're, you're creating greater problems for, for the natural flora that, that's, that's on us. Um, the one that scares me the most, people have asked after I wrote the book, what, what infectious disease are you most nervous about? And I would say it's two, flu, um, simply because it can mutate so well, and then TB, I think is the, the, the granddaddy of all microbes. It's the single worst killer of human beings in our history. Everyone thinks it's the, the more trendy, like smallpox and plague. TB has systematically wiped out one to two million people every year from almost the beginning of humankind, and especially when cities started coming about in the Industrial Revolution. So up until uh, Salman Waksman discovered streptomycin with his student Albert Schatz, TB could not be treated with any antibiotic. Penicillin doesn't do anything to TB. It's, a, it's naturally a very resistant bacteria based on its structure. So when streptomycin was discovered, they, they, you know, everyone in the world celebrated. We finally have something that can get rid of basically a humankind's arch nemesis in the microbial world. Well, and then soon after that, they developed isoniazid and um, PAS and rifampicin, all of these that, that work pretty well in TB. Well, because TB is so resistant naturally to antibiotics, what they started seeing is the gradual increase of resistant strains. And I'm going to tell you a couple of really kind of scary stories related to it. Um, TB still kills about one to two million people every single year. Again, this was killing ancient Egyptians during the times of the pharaohs. Like, they actually found pharaohs with signs of TB uh, in their lungs when they, when they did x-rays of them. This is something that's been with us forever, and it's now as bad as it was in, in 1850 in terms of the number of people it, it's killing. Um, and a lot of the TB issue has come about largely because of the HIV epidemic in, in Africa. TB thrives when someone is immunosuppressed. Um, usually you'll go from an inactive case of TB where you have the nodules but you're not sick, and as soon as your immune system gets suppressed, it reactivates and then you get full-blown pneumonia from it. HIV immunosuppresses you. And so you got a lot of these co-infections, actually a significant portion of people 
in Africa that have HIV also have tuberculosis. And it's, it's a leading cause of death in HIV positive people is tuberculosis. They die of TB, not of the HIV in itself. Well, what's again kind of scary is over the last 20 years, we've been seeing an increase in drug resistant TB. And just to kind of give you some of the, um, the names here, you have multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So you may see MDR TB, and then you have extensively drug resistant tuberculosis. So we're getting more scary. And then you say, well, what would P be? You guys are trying to, it's pan drug resistant tuberculosis, which means it is resistant to everything. So if you have PDR, there is nothing on, no chemical on earth that will, will treat it. So you, you better hope your immune system does something very uh, exceptional to, to treat your disease because there's nothing that can be done at that point. And a couple of scary stories about these. There was a case in 2003, those that are old enough in the room may remember it, but there was a, a lawyer in Atlanta that was diagnosed with, they thought at the time was extensively drug resistant TB, was diagnosed with it, but he was set to be married. And they told him, please do not get on an airplane. We don't know, he was inactive at the time. Again, it wasn't, it hadn't reactivated yet, but they, they, they had um, genotyped it and saw that it was drug resistant. So he said, please don't fly. Uh, a few weeks later, he went, I, I, I trying to remember the tracking, he went from Atlanta to Rome Rome to Prague, Prague to somewhere else, and then that's somewhere else to Montreal. He flew to, I think, like five or six different countries. And then in um, Canada, when he was coming back in the United States, they were supposed to basically involuntarily quarantine him at the border, but the border agent went through, and eventually, once he got back to Atlanta, he, he got quarantined against his wishes, and he filed a lawsuit um, to get released, but um, he, there was a public health act that was uh, passed a hundred years ago that if you're a threat to, the, to uh, society because of your infection, um, they can quarantine you. Typhoid Mary is a great example of that, that she was involuntarily quarantined because she refused to stop spreading uh, typhoid fever. Um, but this il illustrated a major issue, something that happened 300 years ago. Of how do you quarantine when in this global world? Um, how do we have mechanisms to know what strains people are carrying and, and what should be done about stopping travel? There was another case in 2013, very similar thing happened, uh, where someone started wanting to travel, and there they actually caught him before he crossed the border, uh, but he'd already flown on a couple of planes domestically. So everyone on those planes had to be tested for TB, not just once, but over a period of about a year. I myself actually got exposed in my postdoc at University of Miami. Um, we had a guest scientist that was working for a couple of years um, uh, on, a, on a cancer project, and we were in this little, basically, closet of a room at the Hoods, and he was coughing. I'm like, man, that guy is really sick. Like, he should go to the doctor. Turns out he had active TB the entire time I was working with him for like four or five months. Every day I was with this guy, and I just had my newborn daughter at the time. Um, so I was ready to sue University of Miami. I'm a Gator fan, so anything to <laughs> stick it to UM. I was but thankfully, I did not contract TB uh, in, in the case. But it shows you that, um, and, and he didn't have drug-resistant TB, but you could see TB is dangerous in and of itself. Now you got ones that can't be treated, it's, it's even scarier. And then the one that everyone has heard of, the, probably the most famous antibiotic resistant bug, is MRSA. So we're talking about Staph aureus. Staph aureus, for those, uh, I'll assume not everyone in here has been in my microbiology class, it causes a wide variety of infections in humans, most notably wound infections. So if you ever see someone with a wound infection that has an abscess, it's probably Staph aureus that's causing it, but it can cause food poisoning. Uh, in addition to a number of systemic diseases um, that are, are pretty serious. Uh, toxic shock syndrome, you may have heard of, is also caused by staph aureus. Um, very common cause of nosocomial infections, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Those are infections that you get when you end up in the hospital for a different reason and you, you pick up a bug while you're at the hospital. We call those nosocomial infections um, because hospitals, as you know, are kind of dirty places and people are sick all over the place. So if you have staff that's not as careful with cleaning equipment or changing their gloves or washing their hands, they can spread disease from patient to patient. And so staff, because that was that one I was telling you with the beach sand, is very hardy. It can survive on almost anything. Um, so it's very easily spread in a hospital. Um, and so why we are so fearful of MRSA and, and this other one called Versa is that methicillin historically was the last resort and then vancomycin was the last, last resort. So basically when nothing else worked, you would try methicillin, and when that wouldn't work, you would try vancomycin, because they're a little more toxic than some of the other antibiotics. 
So when you see verse, a versa strain or a MRSA strain, you should know that that is resistant to possibly 50, 60 different antibiotics. And just to show you this, for those that have had micro may recognize one of these plates. You don't need to know anything really about the pattern here. But these are little paper discs that are soaked with antibiotic, and each one has a different antibiotic. So when you see this kind of this um, clearing around the disc, that means that the antibiotic is killing the bacteria. So that's what you want to see. If you're testing someone's clinical strain, you want to see the antibiotics killing it. So this is a strain of MRSA, and if you look closely, the bacteria are growing right up to every one of these discs, really except for this one in the middle. That's a kind of a classic, this is called a Kirby-Bauer test. Um, this is not what you want to see if you're a clinician and a patient comes in with Staph aureus infection. That means you are now running out of options to treat them. Um, and this is one of the first tests that they do, and we do this in, in our micro lab just to demonstrate it. I actually acquired a MRSA strain, not personally, uh, in the lab um, for doing some of the research I'm doing, and I, I tested it. Uh, it was a clinical strain from Portugal from a patient, and they've tested upwards of 70 antibiotics uh, that's resistant to. Um, so it's, it's scary uh, as you really start to look at these further. Um, and we see incidence of staph infections that are MRSA or versa as high as 30 to 40 percent uh, in, in certain countries. So another way of saying it, you go in some countries, if you get staph, there's about a 30 percent chance that it's MRSA. And that's not good. Again, that's almost untreatable at that point. So moving away from the specific antibiotics, um, where did all this resistance come from? Uh, and I think that's part of this, this talk tonight, is to educate you, you know, has this resistance always been there? Did we do something really to uh, make it worse? Well, uh, as I kind of alluded to, um, oh, there's a cloud, I want to make sure I'm not going to go freakishly uh, long here. Um, most antibiotics are made by soil microbes, and so most resistance was also f were also found in soil microbes. Now the key is that resistance rarely made it into human pathogens. So for most of human history, all the resistance genes have been found in these harmless soil microbes. The problem is when these resistant harmless soil microbes started coming in contact with human pathogens, then some of those resistant genes moved over. So now we have resistant human pathogens. Um, and when antibiotics were not distributed, really there was no reason why resistant strains would flourish. And let me just show you as an example on the next slide here. Um, it's a little case of, of natural selection evolution. So if you look on, on the, the left side of this picture, the yellow dots are illustrating bacteria that are sensitive to an antibiotic. And the little red dots are illustrating a resistant strain. If I do not add antibiotic to that, the red will have no advantage over the yellow. And basically, they'll stay in pretty much that same ratio. So you won't see an, any increase in resistance if you don't give it that selective pressure. If you don't add antibiotics, you're not weeding anything out. But now let's say I add an antibiotic, let's say penicillin. Well, now I kill all the sensitive, my laser pointer isn't functioning too much. You kill all the sensitive bacteria, and really the ones that survive are the resistant strains. Now you've wiped out their competitors. Now these little red dots, these resistant ones, have free reign in the environment. So before long, you now have a population that's almost entirely resistant. So it was only when we started giving antibiotics for every sniffle that we have that we started selecting for these mutants. And we're going to see this is one of the major issues with resistance is our own activity. Is for everything, we, we prescribe an antibiotic. Um, and every time you do that, you're possibly increasing the risk that this is going to happen. So we'll, we'll talk about that in, in just a minute. So the resistance has always been there. It was human activity that really expanded it and, and, and made it a problem. So um, just a little, this you know, kind of a minute. I don't want to, I'm certainly not going to get heavy into genetics tonight, but how does resistance develop on, on a cellular level? So there's really two ways bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. One is they acquire genes from other bacteria. Like I was just telling you, you have this harmless soil bacterium that has a resistance gene in this little mobile and again, I don't, you don't necessarily need to know the names of these things, but there's these little pieces of DNA called plasmids that bacteria use to swap DNA with one another. So these are like little file sharing uh, mechanisms that, hey, I have something good, I'm going to give you my plasmid so now that you have it. Okay, so this is how bacteria trade genetic information. So we have these resistance genes that are on these plasmids. Um, so you could have a resistant, harmless bacterium here, and now along comes salmonella that is sensitive, and, and this harmless bacteria gives its plasma into the salmonella, now you have resistant salmonella. 
because it's, it's trading genes with one another. And that's a common way that resistance developed. Bacteria love to swap DNA with one another, uh, unfortunately for us. Um, it, it's good for them, it makes them stronger, but this is a problem for us. Now, another way you can become resistant if you're a bacterium is simply mutate your own DNA. So you don't have to acquire something special from someone else, you can just mutate yourself. So if you think about it, an antibiotic always has a target, whether it's a cell wall or a ribosome that we were talking about. Antibiotics have targets. If you mutate the target, the antibiotic no longer binds to it, and so it's useless, essentially. So we see a lot of resistance develop simply just from natural mutations that take place uh, in, in bacterial genomes. And there's really not a lot we can do about those things because bacteria do these things naturally. Now, again, I don't want to get into all the um, little details here, but just to demonstrate that there's a lot of resistance mechanisms. So some bacteria, one way they become resistant is an antibiotic will come in and the bacteria just pump it right back out. Okay, and that's what you see at the top there, that efflux pump. Some bacteria gain resistance by simply just pumping the antibiotic right out, out of itself, so it never builds up to kind of toxic concentrations. There are some bacteria that will get an enzyme that will chop up the antibiotic. So it comes in and it simply clips it. Um, we see this a lot with penicillin, the beta-lactam, where there's enzymes that simply will just cut penicillin. Now penicillin is useless. Um, as I alluded to, there are some that can alter the target, where if I'm going after the ribosome, I'll just change my ribosome. Now the antibiotic no longer sticks to it. There are some cases where um, the bacterial cell will say, if you're gonna block one of my enzymes, well, I'll just use a different enzyme. Now I'm not harmed by that antibiotic. Um, some will alter, chemically alter the antibiotic, and some, kind of more crudely, will just stop it from getting in to begin with. It can actually change its cell wall, it can change its plasma membrane, so that the antibiotic no longer gets in. So this is what we're going against. Again, possibly a billion years of evolution that has developed to inhibit these toxic chemicals. So again, these bacteria have evolved with these to toxic chemicals, the ones in the soil, for, for many, many years. Um, and so this is what we're, we're battling against. Now, this is probably the, the thing I think it's most useful for you guys. What have we done to make this problem worse? Okay, and this is, I think you'll see some of the solutions to this problem. One is, and not to throw my physician friends under the bus, but overprescription classically has been one of the, the biggest issues for resistance. The more you expose bacteria to antibiotics, the more resistance you're gonna get. So the more useless prescriptions, so if someone has a, a, a cold, which is caused by a virus, which antibiotics don't do anything against viruses. They're, they're again, they're bacteria specific. So for every person that has a cold that you give antibiotics, you're increasing the risk of resistance. Um, and I actually, uh, I think it's on the next slide. The last time I was at the doctor's, there was a sign in the office saying, if you have a cold, do not request antibiotics. We will not give them to you. Uh, if you do not agree with this, feel free to leave. Uh, I'm like, whoa, that's, I've never seen a sign like that before, but that's the kind of thing we need. People want a drug when they go to the doctor, right? I, I'm spending 200 bucks to be here, give me something. Rather, don't just tell me to go home and rest. Uh, you know. So doctors, to make their patients just feel better, kind of psychosomatically, have been just giving antibiotics willy-nilly. And so they did a, a study on this, um, CDC and the uh, Journal uh, Medical, American Medical Association, that they estimate about 30% of all antibiotics prescribed were useless. 30%. And, and when you look um, at the numbers, again, that's 40 mi 47 million prescriptions that did not need to be given. That were, again, for something that was completely unrelated to a bacterial infection, but it was to make the patient feel better. Um, and, and that's a problem. Again, the overexposed, this is gonna be a common theme here. The more you expose, the more resistance you get. So the key is limiting exposure. Um, and most of those they found were for upper, you know, for flu and, and rhinoviruses, which cause colds. Antibiotics don't do anything on them, so it's useless to prescribe them. Another issue that I, I've personally seen where a physician, just to save time, won't bother properly diagnosing the patient. They'll be like, I think you have strep throat. That's good enough for me. I'm going to give you this. How many of you, I mean, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I'm assuming most of you have gotten a Z pack at some point. Uh, azithromycin um, for some kind of infection. That's kind of the go-to. It's the most prescribed antibiotic uh, in the United States is azithromycin. Unfortunately, a z -pack is it's a broad-spectrum antibiotic, which means it kind of works okay on a lot of different things, but it doesn't work really well on anything. 
So if you're just broadly prescribing this substandard antibiotic because generally you don't want to put enough time into really diagnosing what they have, because that's the ideal situation. I know you have this strain of, of strep, so I'm going to give you the best possible antibiotic for that infection, rather than, I don't really know what you have, so let me just give you something I know will kill everything. Not kill everything well, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. For a long time, that's how prescriptions have been given. And so there's this movement now in medicine to require, and some countries actually do require, Canada is one, that you cannot prescribe antibiotics unless it's been positively diagnosed. That you can't guess um, just based on your eye. You have to know with some kind of chemical test, uh, microbiological test, to know what you're, you're prescribing, rather than giving, again, these less effective broad spectrums. Um, Another major issue, uh, and, and you guys may not have known this, I didn't know this until I became a microbiologist and really started studying this, that in a lot of countries you can get antibiotics over the counter. United States and, and you know, Western Europe and, and Canada, uh, a lot of these places, you think that's the norm, it really isn't, um, where you need prescriptions. There are uh, some countries, and not, again, to throw any country under the bus, but these percentages are the amount of antibiotic usages that are non-prescription. So if you look at China, 36% of all the antibiotics used in China are someone just going to their local drugstore and, oh, penicillin. Th that's a major problem. We'll talk about why in a little bit. If you're getting penicillin off of a shelf, are you using the right dosage based on your weight? How, what if you stop using it after two days? You're not getting proper instructions for how to use the antibiotic. You're misusing it. Um, Brazil, 46% of the antibiotics are used that are just, again, off the shelf. That's a major problem because, again, people will just use it whenever they don't feel well. Uh, I, don't, I feel kind of under the weather. Let me just go get some antibiotics. They could have a virus. They could have allergies. And they're just going right to antibiotics as, as their first, um, you know, the, the first thing they want to try to cure their infection. And I know they've only included two African countries, but most of sub-Saharan Africa, antibiotics are, are freely available, again, when, th when there's clinics, obviously. Um, no prescription required. That's a major issue, this, this poor regulation. Um, if you guys remember back to that, that RAND, uh, you know, the, the 2050 projections, 10 million deaths a year, you see this is a global issue. And right now you could see that the world isn't necessarily paying attention to this global issue. That's only certain countries. But thankfully the World Health Organization has, has in recent years, really made a big push. Um, and then we're all to blame for this, everyone in this room possibly, or to blame for this next one, which is simply misusage of antibiotics. Oh, I don't feel well. Um, let me go to my Aunt Gertrude's medicine cabinet. Oh, there's some penicillin from 1978. Oh, I th I'm sure it's still good. Uh, no, don't, don't take Aunt Gertrude's penicillin. Um, antibiotics, like any chemical, I don't have an Aunt Gertrude, by the way. Um, they gradually degrade over time, okay? Uh, chemicals do that. So using expired antibiotics or probably the bigger issue, and I've been guilty of this simply because I have a bad memory, I start feeling better and then I forget to take the pill, right? After three days, uh, everyone's kind of, I see a lot of heads nodding. You're on it for, it's supposed to be on it for seven days and day three, you're like, oh, I feel pretty good. I don't need it anymore. Um, what you've done is eliminated 95% of the bacterial population, but that 5% is still there. And if you're unlucky enough to get a random mutant arise, you, that's how resistance you get now a whole resistant population. Remember that selection. What you want to do with antibiotics is shock and all. You want to eliminate 100% of the bacteria in your body um, and not leave any survivors. And that's what the seven-day courses do or the 14-day courses. It, it, the, the blood levels of the antibiotic are so high that it really doesn't allow for survivors, along with your immune system working. So taking it for two days, it's not an effective concentration, even though you feel better. And maybe you overcame it after those two days but again, you're, you're playing a very dangerous game of possibly having resistance arise. Um, I was actually just alluding to this third point here. In countries that have over-the-counter antibiotics not taking the proper dosage, because I'm sure they, they sell the pills as a one dose fits all, and so you have someone that's you know, a, a healthy male that's you know, 250 pounds versus a child, and they may take the same dose uh, according to just you know, like a bottle of aspirin. So that's a major problem that, again, gives rise to um, resistance. And then we actually have had a major issue in the developing nations of counterfeit antibiotics that are diluted out with garbage chemicals just to make it look like it's a, 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 a pill, um, where they'll put you know, basically non-active ingredients in there. Um, so instead of taking what you think is a full dosage, you're taking a one-third dosage, and you don't know it. 
even though you think you're doing the right thing. So again, this is an issue that in the United States we really don't have a lot of control over, but worldwide we, we need to be dealing with this. Um, this was probably the biggest shock to me um, and to a lot of students when they first hear this. The, the number is shocking. 80% of all antibiotics given in the United States are given to animals. I mean, I know humans are animals, sorry, marine biologists. Uh, I know we are animals, but uh, to, you know, agricultural animals, you know, so um, really pigs, cows, and chickens are the, the three greatest um, receivers of antibiotics. You say, why are we giving antibiotics to pigs? Because sickly pigs don't produce, you know, as much bacon. Um, sickly cows don't produce as much milk, and sick chickens don't make as many eggs. They will even spray antibiotics on plants, because there are bacteria that kill plants, too, right, for any botany people in here. There's a lot of ba pathogenic bacteria. So instead of having a, a poor apple crop, I'm going to continuously spray my trees with antibiotics to kill any bad bacteria that may be on there. Um, and the problem is that most of those antibiotics end back in, in the soil and in our drinking, our drinking water supply. They, you know, animals excrete most of the antibiotics you inject into them, into their urine and feces. That then soaks in the ground, which makes it into the water table. And now we can be consuming some of those antibiotics. Again, overexposure was the problem. And they, again, people argue about this number. I've seen 70%, I've seen upwards of 90% of how much antibiotic we inject into an animal ends back into the soil. Um, uh, but it, it's uh, you know, exceptionally high. We're, we're talking at least 70% of it. Um, and you say, well, why do we care about animals getting resistant bugs? Because a lot of things that infect us are from animals. You, you guys know this with chicken. The salmonella is very commonly transmitted by chicken, you know, or the eggs that <coughs> they, they lay. So if you have antibiotic resistant salmonella on the chicken that you're eating and you eat it and you don't poorly cook it, you now are eating antibiotic resistant salmonella. Um, it, it was a rose on the chicken, but now you're ingesting it. And that's really what, you know, this slide uh, is getting into. Um, livestock are really disgusting beasts. Uh, they have a lot of microbes. The milk is disgusting. Sorry, now you guys won't want to eat. Uh, I know too much. It really keeps me up at night. Um, but yeah, so cook all your food really well. But yeah, they, they are filled with microbes, and this is why we, we cook th that, that stuff really well. Um, and again, this is, these are actually real-life infections that have been reported in clinics in the United States. Vancomycin-resistant uh, enterococci, uh, 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 quinoline uh, resistant Campylobacter, which causes um, food poisoning, Campylobacter jejuni, uh, tetracycline resistant E. coli. These were all proven to have come from an animal that had a resistant strain arise on the animal, and then the person ate it and, and became sick with it. So a lot of countries, actually there's a number of the European <coughs> countries, Sweden uh, was one that comes to mind, where they have banned the use of antibiotics in agriculture completely. Um, so I know that's now like the organic thing to do here where, you know, non-antibiotic. It's actually a very good thing to eat non-antibiotic meat. Um, the FDA has put limitations on it um, starting in 2017, but practically speaking, most meat that you eat is still probably been, uh, the animal that it came from was still very likely injected with some kind of antibiotic. But they put some restriction on it. Some countries, a lot again, Europe have outright banned it. I'm hoping in the next five years we'll see a global ban of, of use of antibiotics in animals. And we'll just have to pay a little bit more for our meat products because um, there will be sick ones in there as a result of this. So yeah, this prophylactic use of antibiotics to prevent illness. Uh, I didn't mention that. This isn't to treat sick animals. This is to make sure they don't get sick in the first place. So there, there will be giving, if you have you know, a thousand cows, you'll inject all thousand with these antibiotics so they never get sick in the first place. So again, that's useless antibiotic usage. It's not to treat an infection, it's to prevent one. Antibiotics were never um, developed in the 1940s as a prophylactic uh, to prevent infection. It was always to treat an existing one. Um, I, I already alluded to this, this nosocomial infections in hospitals, a major issue, um, so I don't want to spend too much time on it again, but um, just to frighten you even further, about 60 to 70 percent of all nosocomial infections have some level of resistance. So be careful when you go to the hospital. Um, make sure your, your nursing staff and your physicians are washing their hands before they touch you. Um, the cleaning staff is, is disinfecting things as they go from room to room. Um, it's a major issue. Um, I, I volunteer in a hospital for many years when I was in Florida, and I can't tell you how many MRSA cases I would, I would, as I would go in the room and you'd have to gown up in those cases. And a lot of them didn't have MRSA when they came in the hospital. They came in for a totally different reason, and they were there two months because of an ongoing MRSA infection that wouldn't go away. 
Um, again, not to freak you out about going to the hospital now, but just be careful and show you that this is a real issue. So just not being clean in, in hospital settings. And not to go too deep into HIV, but I've already told you, antibiotics never fully eliminate bacteria. They'll eliminate the vast majority, and they rely on your immune system to finish it off. Okay, so whenever you're sick, you'll kill 99.999% of the bacteria if you're on an antibiotic, but you need your immune system to, to get the last ones. And the problem with people with HIV, and really as you get to late stage AIDS, they don't have a functioning immune system. So every time they get sick, the antibiotics will reduce the, the bacteria in them, but their immune system won't finish it off, and so it comes back. And then they give them a different antibiotic, and then it can't finish it off, and then it comes back. Imagine doing that four or five times. You now are just asking for a resistant strain to be selected for. And, and so we see some of the worst resistance arising in AIDS patients because they're really a hotbed for infection that won't go away. Um, and that's kind of, again, the, the worst case scenario. Um, we talked about drug-resistant tuberculosis. That, that a lot of that MDR and PDR and XDR are actually coming about because of the AIDS epidemic in Africa. Because um, again, they're often co-infecting the same people. Um, all right, so this is where kind of, I guess, I come in with uh, the Small World Initiative. Um, this chart is showing the number of new antibiotics that are developed in a certain time span. So you see in the 80s, we, again, the numbers th themselves don't matter, it's the trend. There were 16 new antibiotics from 83 to 87 that made it to the market. And you see in 88 to 82, only four year span, um, 14, 93 to 97, 10, and look at 20, 2008 to 12, only two new antibiotics made it in um, to market. So companies, and you may think, well, why are companies investing less into antibiotic development? Because of resistance. Why would I spend a billion dollars making a new drug and then six months later, everyone's resist resistance is everywhere. Now no one will use it. So it just was not financially viable for them to do it. So a lot of companies said, I'm out of the antibiotic business. We're not gonna we'll work on something else. This isn't making money for us. That's a major problem, because now again, we have this resistance rising. We're not having any new antibiotics hit the market. Um, and at some point, you know, you're gonna reach a, a tipping point where there's nothing left. Thankfully in the last, five years we've seen kind of a, a reinsurgence of, of new antibiotics, but the number is still scarily kind of low um, in terms of, again, new ones hitting. Um, and so, okay, so now let's get to the positive. So that was all the negative. That was a, an hour of negative. Let's do the positive. How can we help all this? So what can we all do um, to make sure that we don't have 10 million deaths a year in 2050? Number one, hopefully you're not shocked by this statement, reduce exposure. Stop prescribing useless antibiotics. Stop getting out of agriculture. Um, make better diagnoses before you prescribe. As, as again, I told you, Sweden has been really on the forefront of this antibiotic issue. They, they were one of the first to ban use of antibiotics in, um, in agriculture. Um, and, and this is a big one that you've seen in, in uh, I've seen some studies in Latin American countries try this and it's worked really well. For patients that are high risk, and you say, well, who's a high-risk patient? A patient that's likely to stop taking their antibiotics. So the homeless is a big one. Um, homeless, if you've ever worked with the homeless, uh, between getting their stuff stolen, getting caught in the rain, simply losing their belongings, very often when they're sick, they, they'll get antibiotics, and by day three, it's missing. And so, they, again, they're hotbeds for resistance. Uh, and, and TB, is, as I told you, this is the one that keeps me up at night. Because it's such a hardy, resistant bacterium, the antibiotic treatment can be as long as a year. So you're taking an antibiotic every single day for an, and usually two or three of them, every day for a year. I can barely take it for four days without forgetting. Imagine taking something for a year. Oh, I, I, didn't, I forgot to fill my prescription. You know, so what a lot of countries are doing is saying, we don't trust you to do this. So we're gonna require you or we will arrest you, or at least fine you, that you have to come in the clinic and we wanna watch you take this every single day. So they tried this with some of the, the lower income, some of the homeless population. I think it was in Peru, if I remember. Don't quote me on that. It was one of the Latin American countries. I think it was Peru. And they saw rates of resistance drop in that population because of that. They, they were sure of, okay, we know you took it for a full week because we watched you take it for a full week. TB, it's again, even more serious because um, again, with these you know, pan drug resistant strains. So make sure that you have less exposure and better follow through. Uh, again, is the most obvious thing. A major thing is educating the public. Uh, I mean, uh, 
sometimes I'm over ornery about this issue where even the news confuses viruses with you know, flesh-eating virus. I'm like, it's a bacterium, it's not a virus. But you, know, you see this a lot where people don't even understand the difference. So when you say, oh, I'm sick, give me an antibiotic, they don't understand that it doesn't work on viruses. So a lot of it is this education. And, and CDC put out this pamphlet that they, they included in doctor's offices to, um, again, to start this, that antibiotics don't work on viral infections. You know, explain how resistance develops, how you can do basically what I'm telling you tonight, you know, what not to do. Um, and really tell the population what's at stake if we, we fail at this. Again, we're going to be looking at, um, they're estimating this could be the worst, and I don't know how grandiose to get, but possibly the worst epidemic in, in human history if this doesn't get solved, um, to where we could be in a pre-antibiotic age as if we're in the 1600s, where there is no antibiotic that works on any infection. Um, not to make it like, like that's it, that's, the, that's the, the worst case scenario where we no longer can treat bacterial infection. Um, and if we don't do anything, we are, we are heading in that direction. All the trends show that. Um, another thing is really surveillance, uh, and, and we've gotten a lot better with surveillance in terms of um, tracking. Hey, there's been a MRSA case, as I told you, in Florida. Like I heard about it in the news. That was reported from the hospital to the, the um, state of Florida you know, public health. So better surveillance of where these resistant strains are, possibly taking certain antibiotics off the market for certain lengths of time. So if you just stop prescribing a certain antibiotic, theoretically the resistance will die out. And then bring it back in the market and take something else off the market and kind of keep recycling these antibiotics, not just prescribe everything all the time. Say, okay, for these years we're going to give these drugs. Um, but again, you need to work with, with drug companies to make sure that's going to happen. Invest in new antibiotic discovery. There's been a lot um, in, in our government uh, about this of how can we encourage new research in antibiotics and how can we encourage companies to get kind of back in the game. And they talked about tax credits and giving them longer rights so that you can't get generics um, so that you can make more money essentially. <coughs> Faster clinical trials. Some of these clinical trials can last upwards of 10 years. So the idea is, hey, we're going to be in serious trouble in 10 years. We need to fast track this. Is it hurting people? No, it's safe. Is it working pretty well? It's working fine. Let's, let's get into the market. Rather than we need a million safety trials and make sure it's better than everything else we have. That's kind of the current situation. If you develop a new antibiotic, you have to prove it's better than what we already have. Sometimes it's not just being better. Sometimes it's just having something different, a different target. Um, so there's a lot going into this. And then this is kind of where... We got involved in uh, 2015. I, I was I didn't come. I was in Florida in 2014. Uh, this is my bad memory again. 2015 is when I came here to ESU. Um, I applied and, and successfully enrolled ESU in the Small World Initiative. So what this is, it's a, a, as uh, Dr. Elwood said, it's a global consortium. Basically, it's colleges and universities all over the world. And I forget what we're up to now. We have 275 colleges in 41 states and countries all over the world where the students, remember where antibiotics come from mainly, are soil microbes. So what we do here is the, in, the, in my micro class, students will go out in their environment, so they could be along, you know, the, by the lake near their house, or as they're hiking, or right outside of SciTech, the, for the lazy students that forgot to get their soil. That's usually where they get it from. Um, so we've analyzed that soil like 100 times. Um, to collect soil and do a series of tests to see is there something in the soil that's making antibiotic? What is it, and is it new? Okay, um, so uh, again, why soil? Because that's where most of the, the microbes that make antibiotics are. So just to show you kind of what this looks like, this would be, I mean, this is like a perfect plate, so I don't think that that's actually what we see. Anyone that's done it, like, no way does my plate look like this. Um, but this would be kind of a standard plate where you take the bacteria from the soil and you dilute it out a little bit and you put it on a Petri dish. These are the crusty ones or those actinomycetes that I was referring to that make a lot of antibiotics. So what we do is we get this, we then separate them out into a nice clean plate, and then we systematically test each of these to see is it able to kill certain tester organisms. So if I expose this to E. coli, will this kill E. coli? Will this kill staph? So we do this testing, and, and usually they find, students find something, and then when we do this, this is kind of a nice image um, from, from one of our plates, this center streak here that you see is the soil microbe, the new one, and these side streaks are different testers. So you see right here, this, this is actually Pseudomonas, if anyone's interested, this is Pseudomonas, and you see it grew right up to the, te to the, the soil microbe. It's the antibiotic that's making isn't doing anything to Pseudomonas, and that I think is probably E. coli. 
But if you look on this side, this was actually streaked all the way out here. But you notice it's not growing all that way. So what you can see here, it's making a chemical that's going in the agar and it's killing all the bacteria right here. So from this, we would say, hey, it's not killing everything, but we don't need it to kill everything. We need it to kill something. So we say, okay, it's killing, and I think what they, in this image, this is gram-negative bacteria, so like staph and strep. So let's figure out what this is, and let's see if it's new. So what we would do at this point is we would take that, we would purify the DNA out of that, um, sequence it, and then look in databases to see if anyone's ever discovered this. And in the last few years, we've had some, some new species. Uh, one of the grad students that worked in the bio department a few years ago was in Key Largo um, snorkeling, um, having a much better day than most of us in here, uh, and decided to get a handful of the sediment. Uh, it was kind of in a shallow area brought it back in a Ziploc bag and tested it and found a new species of bacteria. Um, we're still trying to figure out what to name it and we're writing the paper up on this that was very effective against all the gram-positive bacteria including Staph aureus, including that MRSA strain that I told you about. That was why I ordered it. I say, hey, this, this new microbe is killing Staph. I wonder if it will kill resistant Staph and it wiped out the MRSA strain. So the next step would be to purify the antibiotic and characterize what type it is and if it's toxic to, to animals because it's useless if it will, will kill the human being, right? So you need something that will kill the bacteria, but not the person. So this just show you this works. And if you have thousands and thousands of students all over the world doing this, the idea is we're, we're kind of um, crowd, crowd share, crowdsourcing, crowd sharing, crowdsourcing, uh, the search for antibiotics. So instead of just set companies doing this, we have thousands of students with all their collective brain power working on this problem at once. And I think it's a, this was developed by, um, a brilliant professor from Yale uh, in, the, in the early 2000s because of this issue. So what can we do? And she started doing this with her own class and she's like, wait, I wonder if we can get universities because there's only so much soil around Yale that's unique. So I wonder what's in Arkansas, what's in Florida. Let's get soil from all over the, the world. Um, and she started the Small World Initiative and it's really been kind of amazing. Um, and and kind of lastly, and this will leave uh, not as long as I'd like, but I'll stick around as long as anyone wants. Um, we got about 15 minutes. Here's the next thing is let's go beyond antibiotics. Clearly, we're sort of fighting a losing battle with antibiotics. These things are becoming resistant. What if, let's think outside the box. Let's look at how people have targeted cancer and, and targeted viruses, which are a lot harder to treat. Let's look at some of their innovative methods and just think outside of poisons, because that's all antibiotics are essentially. And one thing that I have a couple students working on a project now is actually given a mini grant uh, to study this, is can we use viruses that kill bacteria to go after them inside of a human being. Okay, these are called phage. Phage are viruses that kill bacteria. So let's say I have a MRSA strain. And antibiotics aren't working. What if I get a virus that kills Staph aureus? And so this person has this MRSA infection on their arm and I flood their infection with this virus. The virus does the work for us. Um, now phage therapy was thought of 60 years ago, 70 years ago. Phage has been known for, for many decades and they never thought it was a viable option in humans because your immune system, your own immune system will attack that virus. Your immune system doesn't know it's a good virus. It sees something foreign in it and it destroys it. So antibiotics were always more effective than phage in, inside an animal. But now we're at a point where they're not, the antibiotics aren't working. So if this person's gonna die if we don't do something, let's, let's go back to some of our original ideas. Let's use one microbe against another microbe. Let's use a virus against the bacterium. So we're, we're working on that right now um, with uh, staff actually is our model organism uh, and it's actually going pretty well we're, we're um, making good progress then you have things that are beyond my under my chemical understanding but these these nanoparticles that's always in the news um, there, there's been a number of studies where scientists have developed a variety of nanoparticles with a variety of metal types that the metals themselves will kill the bacteria or you can get a nanoparticle that has an antibiotic inside of it to give it better delivery into the cells so there's these silico nanoparticles, but they've had um, silver nanoparticles, really effective so far in, in early uh, trials. And then we have these, these things called antimicrobial peptides. These are chemicals that we make ourselves. Um, there are little sections of amino acids that will pop holes in, in foreign things, essentially. So again, we have antimicrobial peptides. A lot of bacteria make antimicrobial peptides, again, to kill other bacteria. So they're chemically different than antibiotics. And we don't see resistance against them. So the idea is, can we harness these small little peptides that will 
can be used theoretically as an antibiotic in the future. So this is the sort of the future going beyond antibiotics. I'm saying, okay, well, we lost. Antibiotics were great while they lasted. Th we're throwing in the towel. This would be our kind of our next you know, batch of, of therapeutics. Ultimately, I think we need to get more inventive. Um, again, for 60 years, we've been very crude, almost caveman type of treatment. Hey, I have this bacteria, let me add a poison to it. Oh, that doesn't work, let me add two poisons. Three, four, okay, let me, let me make more poisons. And, and that's how we treat bacterial infection. So, and that's how we've treated cancer for a long time with chemotherapy. Let's get a little more inventive. Um, I always say we put, we put people on the moon. We can certainly use that brain power to come up with some new ideas beyond let's just add a chemical poison to a living thing. Um, and, and these are, I think, good starts to that. So with that, I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't freak you out too much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Has there been any work done as, as far as being able to modify the phages to be more Great question. Yeah, so his question, can we, the, the issue with phage therapy is our immune system goes after it. So can we mask it in some way so that the immune system ignores it? Um, we've done that with other types of viruses, certainly. Uh, that was my postdoc where I was working on a virus to attack cancer cells, and it's the same issue. So yes, there has been a lot of studies to try to modify, mainly modify the protein structure um, so at the very least, you get a couple injections worth before the immune system really goes after it. Um, and viruses, I think, are, are a great option because remember, these viruses have co-evolved with the bacteria. So staph was not going to become resistant suddenly to this phage. It's, the phage has evolved with it. Um, so anything the bacteria has thrown at, the phage has also evolved. So I think there may be one of our best options if we can get around the host immune system. And, and maybe nanoparticles can come into play with that, where the nanoparticle delivers the phage directly into the cell, kind of shielding it from the immune system. Um, and then the phage does the work once it's in there. Um, so yeah, great question. I think that's, a, uh, that's one of the main things that they are working on with phage therapy. Um, but right now, I think at the very least, it could be used as a last resort um, if nothing else is working. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, and yeah. Response to politics. What's the story of the current government as <laughs> regards the agricultural industry versus the it's science of reducing agriculture? It's a, a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, we know the federal government controls the FDA, and it's the FDA that, that will, will be putting the bans on antibiotic usage. Um, I don't feel overly optimistic right now. I won't get into politics, but... Um, of, of fighting those lobbies. Ultimately, we need to say this is not a political issue. This is, though, you say about global you know, climate change is the same issue. This is life and death, and if we don't do something, we're not gonna have these antibiotics anymore. So I think that's a million dollar question of how we fight against the, the, the very powerful agricultural lobby, because it's not just those that are, you know, the, the beef industry, you have the, the, those with the, uh, again, the chickens, the, 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 the pigs, but also farmers with their plants. It's the same issue. Um, I'm not overly optimistic, uh, but hopefully the successes in other countries with hopefully more, the op more scientific, open-minded politicians. I don't know if that's necessarily uh, mutually exclusive, but um, I if we can gradually over the next few years change that mentality of, okay, this isn't just, hey, we want organic meat. This is something we need to do. Um, or, or we're going to be in serious trouble in 10 years. Uh, I'm happy to say that there at least have been some restrictions put in place as of 2017. Whether or not they all get overturned in the next couple of years, it's, it's very possible, um, as we've seen with other things. But, um, yeah, I'll, I'll hold out hope. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's one of the issues. There's not enough doctors around to get prescriptions and pharmacies, and so they just make it widely available. Um, your question is arguably one of the best questions in all of epidemiology. How do you take a global issue and, and a, a global health issue and make it a global response? This was an issue during the Black Death uh, in the 1300s. This was an issue in the cholera epidemics in the 1800s. Local authorities don't want to interact with other local authorities because everyone has 
um, financial interest in case. For instance, cholera was really awful in, in India in the 1800s. Well, Great Britain controlled India, so they didn't want restrictions to, for travel to India because it would hurt their bottom line. So they always fought against quarantines and things that would help the world. So I think with antibiotics, we face the same problem. You need the US CDC and the same agency in Great Britain, the same agency in Sierra Leone, and, and all these countries to come together with the World Health Organization and say, these are going to be global restrictions and we want all these countries to sign this or you're out of the UN. That's really kind of extreme that we need to sign this like we do with the, 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 you know, the Paris Climate Accords and things where we want everyone to agree to do this. Um, whether or not that will happen is a question, but this is the single biggest issue. This is a global problem and really like 10 countries are, are fighting it at this time. Um, and every time those countries aren't fighting it, the resistance ends up back into to our, not that US is really great on this issue itself, but um, yeah, the willy-nilly use of antibiotics in the world is, is an issue. Yeah, great question. How we get everyone on board? I don't know the answer to that. Yep. Yeah. So what are other incentives that you can offer your doctors so that they could be like, no, we're not going to do this? Yeah, um, this, yeah, it's like with money in politics, it, it, it's an issue that's causing improper usage. Um, you know, if you're getting profits as a physician for prescribing it, and you really, I mean, ho we hope that physicians understand the, the public health issue here, and they are ethical enough to not just do this to make money, but as we all know, there's unethical people in every profession um, of how do you stop the kickbacks for, for just, you know, everyone gets, you know, the antibiotic because I'm making money off of it and they gave me a free trip to Aspen. Um, I don't know how you stop that other than talking about lobbies of, of getting the American Medical Association involved and saying this stops. Um, no longer are drug companies able to give kickback kickbacks to doctors and have them keep their license. Short of doing that, I don't know we could ever stop it. Yeah, that's uh, another really great question that I wish I had a good answer to. Unfortunately, I don't. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Good question. So that I think would work. The problem is the microbes that are problems for us, MRSA, tuberculosis, aren't a problem for the soil microbes. So that's not their real competitor. So let's say you took drug-resistant TB and, and put soil around it. There's really no incentive for the soil microbes to attack the TB because it's not one of its direct competitors in the soil. Um, but yeah, actually, your idea uh, won a Nobel Prize. Um, that was actually how they discovered streptomycin. Salman Waksman surmised, hey, when we bury someone that died of TB in the ground, when we, if we exhume them six months later, there's no more TB bacteria. Like, well, where'd they go? Well, they're being killed by something. Maybe there's something in the soil doing that. Let's go looking for it. And, and they found it. Um, but yeah, I think the issue will, will ultimately be the, the microbes making the antibiotics are not direct competitors with human pathogens. Uh, but ultimately, the you know, Small World Initiative, we're kind of doing that in an in vitro situation where we're artificially taking them and putting them side by side and saying, hey, will you make something that will kill it? I think really our greatest um, source is going to be chemical companies. Uh, I mean, chemis chemists are brilliant. You can come up with an infinite variety of new chemicals that possibly could attack bacteria in totally different ways. I showed you that one picture of what we usually attack, the cell wall, the ribosomes. There's a lot of other possible targets that maybe haven't been discovered yet. Um, and there's a really brilliant scientist, the name escapes me right now, at Northeastern University, that he's doing these high throughput analysis where he has deals with drug companies and they're working together and they're synthesizing all these crazy organic compounds and they're systematically testing each one on this panel of bacteria. And they found a few recently published in Science that they've tested and tested and tested and haven't found any resistance developed. Um, so that is another kind of possible source is really get the chemist fully on board with this to come up with something new. Um, and maybe nature, we've run its course and what nature can produce and let's get chemists on it. Yep. Uh, you said antibiotic excessive antibiotic resistance cause or use mm -mm.
Well, and I would say take it if the doctor gives it, um, unless you are a microbiologist or a physician or you know, in the medical industry. Um, you hope that your physician, physician's assistant, nurse practitioner, they're going to be educated enough to not prescribe it when it's unnecessary. So um, I've been accused of this and have failed miserably when I've tried to be a, a self doc oh, I read WebMDs, web um, certainly an expert in medicine. Don't try to self-diagnose or self-treat. So I, would, I wouldn't um, take it if, if you get it, um, but yeah, don't try to self-diagnose. It could be dangerous. Um, and so I, I mean, with all my knowledge of microbiology, if a doctor says you really need to take this, I, I do take it. Even though I, I think it's probably viral, um, I'm gonna err on the side of their judgment. Because um, if I'm wrong, then I could be dead from it. So I'll, I'll listen to them. Uh, yeah, great question. Any other question? Yeah. Great question. That's where my expertise ends. I am not a biochemist, and you really need a biochemist to be able to purify it properly um, and, and use NMR and IR to really characterize the 3D, you know, the structure of it. And so what um, the Small World Initiative actually just got a major grant um, to partner with um, chemical companies. So basically when we discover a bug, now we could just send the bacterium to them, and they'll do the extraction, the characterization for us for free. And that's actually the next step with that Key Largo one. Um, we're going to send it off and see if they can. I tried to purify and I failed miserably. I, I'm really, uh, I did okay in organic chem, but no, I am not. I, re I realized I am not a chemist and I just couldn't do it. Um, and I talked with Dr. Lafredo and had his thoughts. And I realized I don't have the capabilities of doing this, so I need to send it on. This is where you need consortium. You, you need people with different expertise getting involved. Um, say, okay, I've reached the end. I'm a microbiologist. I got you the bug. Now figure out what it is, and then ultimately you need to then do animal testing and possibly even then human trials, and that again is beyond me. So everyone would play a role in it. Great question. Yeah, you, you do need to characterize it. If it's toxic to people, it's less useful, but yeah. Yes? Yeah. So after that, I was like, okay, let's go after all aquatic. Uh, we did cranberry bog over there. Turns out um, aquatic environments are much more difficult. They have a much lower quantity of actinomycetes. We just got really lucky with that one. Um, I, I've looked at probably 30 different aquatic samples. And sometimes you'll get a, a jackpot. Other times there'll be nothing on the plate. Or you saw that plate that was up there that had all, I, I'll have plates from an aquatic sample with zero. Absolutely not one kind. I know there's bacteria in there. It's just we didn't get any actinomycetes. So um, I tell students to go for soil because I don't want them to be disappointed having an empty plate just in doing the experiment. But no, absolutely. That's why I went because when you look, almost no antibiotics ever been derived from an aquatic microorganism. They're all just on kind of standard, you know, nice rich soil. Um, so I thought that was a major untapped because there are antibiotic producers in water and there are things that they're trying to kill in water. So. Um, and much of the, most of the earth is covered in water, so I think it's a really untapped um, source of possible new antibiotics, but it's a bit more difficult to find them because, you know, it's dilute, you know, it's not concentrated. Soil is so rich in microbes, whereas most water sources hopefully, you know, aren't um, to, you know, to make us sick. But, uh, yeah, great question, and, and um, I've tried it a few times, and, and I still haven't given up on it. I think I just need to be a little more clever on how we work with the water. Yep, great question. Looks like we're about out of time. Thank you guys for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you.